The lawfare we have recently seen against many people in America, like President Trump and others, who dissent from the Uniparty and are breaking the orthodoxy in every single way, is, and to the eyes of many Americans, quite unprecedented. In fact, the, the phrase that we live in a two-tiered system of justice, which is rather popular in conservative circles, only really emerged in the past few years as of the posting of this video. And beforehand, you would not have seen this kind of language spoken by conservative-minded people in America. In fact, a few years ago, conservative-minded people in America, when it came to the justice system and the police, were almost, not uniformly, but many of them were back the blue, but that language has been tempered as we have seen the corruption of the justice system and the kind of actors that have gotten into power and have used it for their own ends. But I'm here to tell all of you that this, this didn't begin just two, three, or four years ago. And it is important for us as Americans who, who are supposed to live in a republic that is committed to moral premises, that, that is supposed to be a shining light to the rest of the world on how to run a nation and how to respect the rights of the individual and also how to respect the nature of reality as it relates to what your government is based on. But all of those things that I just mentioned are threatened when we get into the idea of people using po a prosecution, people using the law to punish the political enemies as opposed to pursuing justice. And, and this really is a crisis of principles. And that's where I wanna focus. By the end of this video, I expect you to have a full understanding of a few things relating to lawfare, which I define as the use of the legal system to oppress and persecute political enemies under some kind of false pretense. That is lawfare. Usually, you literally using the law, using litigation, using the courts, using prosecution to wage war against those you don't like. The use of lawfare, my friends, is something you will understand by the end of this video, but you'll also understand how the legal system could have gotten to a place where such behavior, such conduct, is not only seen as standard, it's not really challenged and hasn't been challenged until high profile people have actually encountered. I want you to also understand what it makes, what it takes to have a good legal system. One based on universal principles and not based on the personal pursuits of a particular individual. And so by the end of this video, you'll understand all of that. It is my hope. Now, I'm not going to go into particular incidences of lawfare. In fact, my friend Robert Guvia, who will be joining me later in the video, will be the one to do that. He has a lot of information about that, how it actually works and the mechanics of it. But I simply wanna walk you guys through a story, a story of how our legal system actually got to this point. So let's start in the abstract first. Every system, every institution is based on a foundation. A house, every house has a foundation. Likewise, every government has a foundation. And likewise, the processes of the government, which would be its legal system, also have a foundation. And the proper foundation of the American justice system is to, as the name suggests, pursue justice. Now, what is justice? Well, justice in the American sense, which, which really, we, we developed this idea of justice from the Enlightenment, simply means a few things. Number one, adhering to your contracts. Number two, refraining from what doesn't belong to you. And number three, ensuring that you understand just why those two previous things are important to a broader society. That kind of is incidental to the idea of justice, but it's important to ensure justice is maintained. Justice is the principle that allows society to exist in the first place. If we had no standard of justice in society, there would be no way to moderate conflicts. There would be no way to ensure that someone's promises could be kept in, 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 a, a, in a reliable manner. Of course, someone can give you the word, and ideally, you should be able to have someone's word as a means of assuring their promises. But obviously, that doesn't always work. There are bad people in this world, so justice adds an extra safeguard. And more importantly, there will be nothing inhibiting someone from going against you when they didn't like you or when they just felt like it. There will be nothing inhibiting someone from doing some of the most odious things, the most grotesque things to you, just because they don't like you. This idea of justice is rooted in the nature of things. It's rooted in how things are in reality and how things must necessarily, must necessarily be. You see, man, and, and this will be, we'll get into this a little bit later, man has been pushing against 
for his for for the past few hundred years. Man has been pushing against reality, trying to run athwart reality, as opposed to conforming himself to reality. The American Revolution was this was this assertion of the laws and principles of reality over a tyrant who sought to defy him to enhance his own personal advancement and the advancement of his foul empire. So whenever you push against reality, you should not expect things to go well with you. So we need justice to live, to live well, and to live at all. Without justice, human relationships devolve into chaos and destruction. And so the justice system is meant to ensure that justice is served on several levels, the federal level, the state level, and the local level. And the legal system for a very long time in America, which was founded on first principles, for a very long time used first principles, used philosophical ideas and moral sentiments to justify particular court rulings that were passed down from judges on the federal level and the Supreme Court. In fact, if you go back further enough to Supreme Court history, you won't see citations of common law or precedent as much as you will see, rather, citations of philosophical principles, first principles, and moral sentiments. Now, here is where things always go wrong. When you deviate from the truth, when you deviate from reality, when you deviate from objective principles that can be assessed and certified by your ability to reason as a human being, you end up going into someone's personal preference. And when personal preference becomes the standard of the day, almost anything is permitted, including, yes, things that are harmful to the principles that are meant to be maintained by those particular systems. Hence, welcome to the progressive era. The progressive era in America is perhaps the, the single most period that one can look back to in the history of our country and point at it and say, this is where things started to go wrong on both a cultural, social, philosophical, and political level. This is where Americans began to go away in mass from the foundations of their nation. They began to eschew and avoid the intellectual tradition that we as Americans inherit. Unlike other countries, we don't inherit an ethnic tradition or a, or a lineage uh, a tradition. We inherit intellectual tradition based on ideals that we can obtain by virtue of us being human. Well, in the progressive era, Americans started to go away from that because the argument was there was a bunch of fraud and abuse of innocent people and there was a need for the government to step in and fix the issues. Now, we won't litigate that particular claim here. We don't have enough time in the world to litigate that particular claim, although I, you should all know that I'm very skeptical of that particular claim. But regardless, the material facts of what happened to our legal system during the progressive era really set us up for the lawfare we have seen over the past 50 and 60 years in America. Allow me to give you some examples. During the progressive era, the progressive reformers of the day, including presidents like Theodore Roosevelt, and also a bunch of other, other politicians and activists, they wanted to take America away from its constitutional foundations, what they call abstract rules, the ideas that the law system is supposed to protect justice, which by consequence protects property rights, by consequence ensures you have the ability to, to, to practice all your other rights. Because man who does not own himself, does not own his property, cannot own his own rights, and therefore he can't practice his other rights. All of that, they said, was bad because it didn't consider the social circumstances of the day. And the prevailing sentiment was that the legal system should consider not the principles, but the circumstances of any given time. And it should conform to that as opposed to being based on higher ideals. It should, it should conform to the temporary things of life, the inferior things of life, as opposed to the higher things of life. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt himself was quite clear. He said when a judge decides a constitutional question, when he decides what the people as a whole can and cannot do, the people should have the right to recall the decision if they think it is wrong, which is why during the progressive era, there were several reformers that actually wanted to set up recall elections for state judges to ensure that they would stay in sync with public opinion. Also, there was a move to get rid of a judicial review and to simply have judges rule on the specific matters at hand, as opposed to bringing in the broader constitutional question. Now, this initiative largely failed to materialize. It didn't really make, they didn't really make all of the reforms they wanted to make. And this didn't just happen during the early part of the progressive era. This also happened during FDR's presidency. FDR, for those of you who remember, tried to pack the courts when they would go, when they went, went against his New Deal agenda. And that didn't go out well for him as well. So 
all in all, the progressives largely didn't get what they want on, in, in a, on a policy level during this era. But they got what they want philosophically because they smuggled in ideas from Europe, particularly Germany, particularly from the rulership of Otto von Bismarck, into the American legal system and then went to law schools, had people in law schools saying these ideas and trained up generations of lawyers under those particular ideas. So, for example, Roscoe Pound, who was a professor of law, a very profound person during the progressive era, he said that the problem of our legal system was that it relied on what he called mechanistic jurisprudence. And he said that we should adopt sociological jurisprudence. And what that means, according to Pound, was that he believed that the decisions of the court should not rest on the facts of the law, the facts of the Constitution or the moral premises of our republic. They should instead rest on what the condition of society is at any given time. In fact, Pond himself said that this, this idea that he has is a conception of the law. It's a conception of the law as a means towards social ends, and it would require judges to keep in touch with life. Edward R. Ke R. Keady, who was a University of Pennsylvania law professor, also said that this sociological jurisprudence was good, and he was pleased to find that it moved legal thought in America away from reverence for fixed principles and towards the consideration of economic, industrial, and social merits of the particular con controversy, away from artificiality towards simplicity, and from individualistic towards a collective attitude. This was an exact quote from him. These were law professors putting the seeds of anti-Americanism into our law system, subverting our moral foundations as a nation, and then replacing them with ideas that smuggled in from Europe that were fundamentally anti-American. This is the beginning of the justification for lawfare. Then you go overhead to the 1950s, 1940s, 1950s. We had a communism problem in America. We had a serious problem. Communists were infiltrating the government, and there was a lot of people in America that were sitting communists. And there was a problem, but the right at that time took it too far, and they empowered institutions like the FBI to start a program called COINTELPRO, which the FBI used not just to persecute communists, which is unjust in itself. You, as, as an American, you have the right to free expression. They also used it to persecute people they just didn't like, the Black Panthers, the, 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 the student count, uh, um, uh, leadership conference that was one of the biggest extolers of the civil rights movement. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., the Vietnam War protesters. They literally, the goal of COINTELPRO was to subvert, destabilize, expose, and ruin, as J. Edward Hoover said in a memo, all of these different social movements that they didn't like. The government waged lawfare through manipulation and psychological warfare and even assassination. They killed Fred Hampton, who was a Black Panther officer. They waged lawfare against Americans and did so, and even admitted they did so, because in the 1970s, when a group of great citizens went into Pennsylvania, media, media Pennsylvania, and broke into an FBI office and leaked everything, the church committee, which investigated COINTELPRO, basically came out and said, yes, the FBI did everything we're saying they did. And the FBI said, yeah, we won't do it again. This was one of the most egregious and first instances of lawfare. And of course, throughout American history, there are plenty more. But do you understand how shifting our legal system from foundational principles that are independent of one man's whim to the considerations of the day can easily allow tyrants to abuse our system for their own ends? Because the considerations of the, of the day are subjective, they are temporal, and they are fleeting. There is no consistency to them, so they can mean anything and everything depending on the person involved, depending on the person's particular interest. You cannot have a system of truth based on opinion, mere opinion. You can only have a system of truth based on foundations. And this is what a lot of these influencers are not telling you. They're not giving you fruit. They're not giving you substance that you can understand these issues. They're just saying we have a two-tiered system of justice. That's correct. But how do we get there? How do we get to a system of political prosecution or political Persecution through prosecution. We got there because the foundations at the core of our republic were corrupted and rotten and thrown out by a bunch of low quality intellectuals that infiltrated the universities and then, through subversion of proper understanding, managed to instill people in power to do evil things. This is how it happens. Ideas precede behavior, ideas precede accomplishment. 
That's how it happened. That's how we got here, in a nutshell. Also, the astute observer will note that the law being about social interests as opposed to higher principles immediately puts it so whoever has the most ability to voice their interest in the biggest way, whatever the most agreed group is that has claimed a social interest, well, they can really direct the future in the course of the law. Do you see how that one statement uttered in the progressive era, which animated so many progressive ideas and philosophies, which birthed the administrative state, which birthed much of the apparatus that we now see doing lawfare, also influences how the woke left today perceives and understands and views the nature of the world? Do you see? Everything is downstream from a foundation, and that's the rotten foundation, the idea that expression, the cult of expression, how I feel at a particular time, you know, what my feelings are towards a particular issue, or how I want to express myself, who I truly am inside, how all of that, which by itself may be fine for a private individual, but when taken to be legal and political and moral standard, can go ahead and tyrannize an entire people and break what is proper and destroy what is good. Do you see? Do you see? Because the subjective can't account for what must be done. It can only account for what I want to do. But what I want to do is not necessarily in sync with the truth unless I put myself in accordance with something higher to me than me. But if you're all about expression, you cannot see the forest or the trees. You just see the shrubs and the branches and the leaves and you think it's a whole damn forest. This is the insanity we're in right now, the philosophical, conceptual, moral insanity that we're in right now. All explain that one sentence. Now, Robert Gouvia, who is a brilliant person, one of the best law supers on YouTube, is going to walk you through particular instances of lawfare. And he's going to explain more about how we got here. And he's also going to explain what we can do to understand this issue more. Hey, Christian, great question. Thanks for inviting me to opine. Lawfare in America. Of course, this is happening everywhere. We talk a lot about it. But today I want to go through a couple examples. And when I think about lawfare, I break it up into two different categories. Think about it as hard power and soft power. Hard power is direct action against people, political opponents. These are direct attacks that might sideline a specific person or an organization versus soft power, which is co-opting power. It's morphing institutions. It's morphing laws into something that is more useful for the person who wants to see the change. So there's a bunch of this going on. One of the most obvious examples of the hard power lawfare attack, of course, is Donald Trump. He has four indictments in one year. This is happening at a time when the pinnacle of the prosecutions will coincide with the election year. So he's being charged in 2023, but all of the trials will climax right at the crest of election season, all done by design. We've talked about many of these prosecutions all popping up one after another. The first one came out of New York with Alvin Bragg. That was for the payments case. We had the classified documents case in Florida, which was another indictment brought by Jack Smith. We have the latest indictment, which is in Washington, D.C. for the January 6th case. And Georgia is preparing their indictment. By the time you're watching, this may have been a fourth indictment. We've got superseding indictments. And this is just the pieces being moved around on the chessboard to take out their political opponent, all done by design. They could have prosecuted this a long time ago. They could have declined to prosecute these things like they did to other people who've also challenged prior elections or had classified documents or done very much the same type of conduct that they're alleging Trump did. But Trump is their political enemy, and that is hard power taking place at the federal level. Same thing happens with the J6ers. These are specific people that were big Trump fans, all being targeted to chill their involvement, to stop them from being active the next time around. Now that's at the federal level, but we also have the state level where we're seeing the same thing. We know that recently in Michigan, Dana, Dana Nassel over from the attorney general's office in Michigan indicted a whole slew of the alternate selectors, the alternate electors rather, coming out of Michigan. And this was a situation where these people were creating a contingency plan that if Mike Pence had decided to reject the electoral votes or ask for a pause, then the alternative electors could have made their case that the state legislature authorized them to go cast their votes, 
which would contrast to the executive branch, which was the other body that was authorizing the, the original votes. And there's mechanisms in the Constitution and there's history where stuff like this has happened. But now the attorney general is prosecuting these alternate electors. And the alternate electors are a group of people who are some of the biggest GOP individuals in the state, right? They're very active. I'm sure they're very helpful to GOP efforts. And now they are all going to be under criminal investigation by the Democrat attorney general in Michigan, meaning in that swing state, a big part of Trump's team is going to be decapitated. They're going to be thrown out of the game because they are being prosecuted. And I think this is very important. It's going to be chilling the teammates that Trump is going to be able to recruit. And we know that there are rumors of additional prosecutions taking place in Arizona, where it was close, in Wisconsin, in Georgia. These were all battleground states. Of course, if they can take out Trump's deputies or the GOP's top leaders in those various states, going to make it harder for the GOP to replace those people and to win. And so they'll, I think, launch more of those types of attacks on Trump allies, taking out specific people. Now, the hard power is chilling in addition to that. It's going after those specific people. It's going after Trump. It's going after the J6ers. But there's also groups like the 65 Project, which are attacking lawyers who are supporting Trump. So they're using the law and ethical rules, and they're saying, hey, lawyers, you shouldn't be representing an insurrectionist, and they're going to state bars, and they're saying these lawyers should be disbarred. And that is using the law and the ethical power to take out Trump's team. And other politicians, I think, will be under the same types of attack when Trump's time is up. We see how they do. They just swap it out. Bush used to be the worst thing in the world until he was not in office anymore. Now Trump is. And when Trump's not in office anymore, these same tactics will be used against other people. Now, I want to compare and contrast that against soft power. Soft power is a little bit different. It's not a direct attack on Donald Trump. It's not a direct attack on individual citizens. But instead, it's co-opting various institutions. And so on our channel, we spent a lot of time prior to the 2020 election talking about election litigation, which is a different type of lawfare. There's an organization that exists now called Democracy Docket. It's run by a guy called Mark Elias. And their organization in 2020 filed dozens of lawsuits, maybe hundreds, all over the place challenging the election rules. We know that state legislatures have the election power given to them by the Constitution. They govern how elections work. But when COVID hit, the secretaries of state and the executive branches, they all said, oh, no, this is going to be a problem for our citizens. And so we need to extend deadlines or we need to lower signature requirement verifications or we need to authorize ballot boxes or authorize massive uh, allowances of mail-in vote voting because that's going to close the enthusiasm gap for the Democrats. They knew that Joe Biden was campaigning from a basement. They knew COVID gave the executive branches a nice excuse to go and convince the courts to change the election rules outside of the purview of the legislative branch. We've got a separation of powers and the executive branch usurped those powers from the legislatures. And they did that all in the back of COVID. And that, in my opinion, changed the outcome of the election. It was enough to close the enthusiasm gap. It was enough to get a margin that would put them ahead in certain demographics, certain uh, counties, certain states, certain locations. And these were very strategic lawsuits in various counties, in various states, and it was done methodically. And it worked. They got a lot of stuff changed. And now they are trying to stop the states from reverting back. So after 2020, a lot of states said, that's not appropriate. You can't usurp the legislature. And they reverted back. They put more tight restrictions on mail-in voting and signature verification, and they want to increase the integrity of their elections. But now these same entities, guys like Mark Elias and the Democracy Docket, are using the same tactics. They're doing it again. And this time they're saying that if you reverse, if you go back and change the election rules to pre-2020, now you're going to be removing people's civil rights. You're going to be removing their ability to vote. They've already gotten used to these new things. They expect it. And if you take that away from them, you're going to be violating their civil liberties. And so they want to keep these same changes in place 
because it served them very well. There's going to be the same type of effort, I believe, from the Biden people. If he's running, it's going to be a muted campaign where he's not put out in front of the cameras. And so there's going to be an enthusiasm gap. And they want their systems of voting to take precedence over a Republican plan for voting. And they're using the courts to do it, filing lawsuits all over the place. And is the Republican Party responding to these things? Are they creating their own counter-democracy dockets? Or do they have anybody who is spearheading these efforts? Not that I've seen, but maybe they will start recognizing this is a major part of the game and playing accordingly. We also have organizations like the Center for Countering Hate. Jim Jordan just sent a letter to this organization demanding to know more about their efforts, and they literally exist to work to censor and ban people on the internet. So not only did we know that the FBI was doing this, they were using the strong arm of the government. We saw this in the Twitter files. Jim Jordan has released more of the Facebook files explaining how the FBI would send emails, they would monitor social media companies and demand removals when they got pressure from the White House or from other entities, literally censoring Americans. But they got a little bit smart about this and they created these third party entities like the Center for Countering Hate. And the Center for Countering Hate then will go to Facebook, go to YouTube and these big companies and say, if you allow misinformation to spread on your platform, you are violating civil rights. You are violating civil liberties by promoting these untruths. And that is a threat of litigation, saying you're violating somebody's rights by doing these things. If you keep doing these things, we're in cahoots with the government. We're working with the Biden administration. We're going to come either lobby against you so that Congress will use their power to silence you or to get you to comply with their efforts to silence others. Or it's just a continual effort to ban and suppress speech from all, all areas from the federal government. And so the FBI did this. The big tech companies have done this. And now we have third parties like the Center for Countering Hate putting pressure on the big tech companies saying, if you don't act, we will enable litigation against you. So everywhere we look, they are taking action in the courts, using political pressure, using third parties. They're changing the nature of free speech by censoring people, which is a violation of our civil liberties. But they say that if you are allowed to speak freely, it's a violation of other civil liberties. They're changing the nature of elections, using the courts and the secretaries of states to do it. They're prosecuting their political opponents, obviously Donald Trump. They're decapitating Republican leaders throughout the country with individual prosecutions. And there is a ton, a ton of money being put into these law firms and these third party organizations to chronicle all of the dangerous misinfo on Twitter and to demand that Facebook and other entities censor people. And so I certainly hope that the Republicans wake up to this and see more of this happening because it's open and on display. They're raising money, they're filing lawsuits, and we can follow along with many of these efforts. And in my opinion, they were consequential in 2020. They're elevating those tactics. In 2020, we had a lot of censorship and we had a lot of problems, but they have escalated it now to the point where we've got four indictments for a former president, a hundred plus people sitting in custody for J6. We've got dozens of GOP leaders being prosecuted. We've got lawyers who are only representing their clients. We have a right to counsel in this country. They're representing their clients. They're being charged as co-conspirators. There's other organizations trying to disbar them. So it's a pretty precarious position. The Republicans and the GOP and people who love freedom, I hope spend some effort and some time buttressing these efforts to fight back against these individuals who are waging this battle. And so I appreciate you calling attention to this lawfare happening all across America. Thanks for the invite, Christian. Have a great day. My friends, I've, I've held you for very long, but you must understand this. In America, this is not supposed to happen. And this doesn't have to happen. We need a revolution of the mind. We need an American populist that will assert philosophical principles, that will use reason, and that will use sound thinking whenever they approach any issue, whether it be lawfare or whatever else. And it's my intention, as someone who studies this stuff and is trying to push America towards a better condition, 
to really help us get to that point. So my friends, study philosophy, study history, remain morally convicted. If you want to support my content, like this video, comment on this video, share this video, subscribe to this channel. I love you guys so much. And please stay pensive. Bye, guys.